Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Lisa Versace, and I'm the Programs and Engagement Manager here at the California Preservation Foundation. Uh, CPF is a member-based not-for-profit organization whose mission is to provide statewide leadership in preservation, education, and advocacy to ensure the protection of historic resources in California. Today's webinar will be a discussion between author Rosa Lowinger and preservation architect John Fiddler about Rosa's new book entitled Dwell Time, a memoir of art, exile, and repair. The webinar will run approximately an hour uh, with a discussion between Rosa and John and 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the webinar for your questions. If at any point in time during the program you would like to add your questions to the Q&A box, please feel free to do so and we'll do our best to address all of, our, all of your questions at the end of the program. We appreciate your taking the time today to join us and encourage you to support our work by becoming a member. Information can be found on our website at californiapreservation.org where you can also find out about upcoming programs. And with that, I will hand it over to John Fiddler to get us underway. John? Thanks very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm uh, a preservation architect here in the States, but uh, you can tell from my accent, uh, <laughs> I'm not from around here. I practiced for many years in the United Kingdom and uh, for a long while helped to run English Heritage. Rosa and I have worked on building conservation projects for many years. And besides being uh, an entertaining author, she's also an expert art conservator, um, large outdoor sculptures being uh, one of many specialties in the field. And we're going to talk about her new book, which you're going to hear quite a lot about, um, Dwell Time, which is a reference, of course, to uh, how we in the business um, make chemicals work to our advantage. Um, and we can get into that somewhat. And I'm going to focus uh, my questions really on one of the key aspects of the book. In fact, one of the ways that it um, drives along, which is, is references constantly and a focus on uh, art and building conservation in, in various ways. Um, for most of us, uh, as David Lowenthal once said, the past is a foreign country. We visit it occasionally and we make our own subjective uh, opinions uh, about it. But for Rosa in this book, um, you've obviously visited it very thoroughly and at a personal level gained many insights for which I, I totally bless you. It's a fascinating uh, and bold memoir, a history of you and your Jewish family's trajectory through three, maybe four generations from Eastern Europe, first to Cuba, uh, and then to the USA. It's a, a, in a, set in a redemptive and cathartic framework of personal discovery and analysis, um, uh, but in a context of the art and conservation field, metaphors and parables about materials uh, abound in the text, which I found uh, uh, very interesting and insightful, uh, not only about their properties, but their decay mechanisms and how we uh, interfere with those over time uh, and to uh, retain beauty and, and meaning in, in a variety of ways. Uh, obviously, the book pulls no punches about your, your uh, self and your family. Um, but I, I, I hope, well, I, I know from the reading of the book that you've gained um, a kind of um, um, restoration through the process, which we're going to get talking about. So let's, let's just set a context for this big story in the book, and then we'll get into the conservation stuff, Rosa. Um, in terms of timelines, from uh, when and from where did your your grandparents migrate from Eastern Europe. So you can, can you hear me well? Great. So my my um, grandparents, my two grandfathers left Eastern Europe, different parts of Romania in the 1920s. And they were headed for America as many Europeans were at that time. But there were very strict immigration laws in the twenties. The United States was crazed about immigration back then as it is now. And so 
the boats that left from wherever they left would say America, and you could wind up in Ellis Island, or you could wind up in Buenos Aires. And Havana was a pretty good second place to end up because the U.S. and Cuba had a very open door between them. So within six months, you were a welcomed immigrant to the United States from a Latin American country. Ironically, Latin Americans had no trouble coming into the U.S. back then, and it was Eastern Europeans. So that's where the story begins. Cool. Um, and, and migrations <laughs> from Eastern Europe, obviously, are connected with pogroms of various kinds that, that I know. Um, Romania, Moldavia, those places particularly suffered, uh, I was only hearing this yesterday uh, on a BBC podcast, oh, from wow. the uh, outcome of the Treaty of Versailles after the First World War and economic mm. um, pressure and decline in Eastern Europe, uh, which caused a lot of economic as well as political and religious migration uh, of refugee right. communities in various places. Um, when they when they arrived, um, your grandparents arrived in in Cuba. Um, it must have been uh, uh, presumably to Havana. It must have been a place which had not been on, um, in a very good condition for a very long time. And as you were subsequently born later on and got to grasp your environment, you must have found it. Um, um, filled with grandiose buildings, but not in good condition at that time. Is that right? Well, you see, I don't know what the building's condition was at the time my grandparents arrived there. I would assume they weren't in terrible shape simply because they were occupied and in use and had private owners for the most wow. part. Um, and also in the 1920s, when they arrived, was it, they, were, they arrived in the middle of a gigantic building boom in wow. Havana. So much construction was going on because the Republic was only 20 years old. The, <clears throat> the Cuban War of Independence, what we call here the Spanish-American War, was fought in the late 19th century. The United States occupied Cuba till like 1902, and that's when the Republic was founded. So we're talking 24 years. Construction was rampant. And interestingly, the technology of reinforced concrete arrived in Cuba very quickly after the beginning of the 20th century. So they just went hog wild with reinforced concrete. So there was a lot of construction. And in fact, my paternal grandfather left Havana quickly to move and work on the cross island um, uh, Carretera Central, the central highway that traversed the island as men. And, you know, and, and by 1930, there was a new Capitol building, big boom. Fascinating. So. I, I imagine architects, Cuban architects of the, of the period were, were training um, outside the, the country, outside the island, um, and presumably some Eastern European architects arrived there as they, as they did in North America. And a lot of Spanish architects as well. There was a, there was a lot of, um, there were, there, the University of Havana was a respected school even back then, and they were training architects but um, the the travel, a lot of Cubans, um, a lot of European architects came to Cuba later, like in the 40s, when, when Cuban architects discovered modernism. And my colleague, Eduardo Luis Rodriguez, writes about how it was part of an overall concept within Cuban intellectual and creative classes to think of what might they do to create an expression that was uniquely Cuban, like how... How do we describe Cubanidad? And the architects basically took international style modernism and went wild with it. So everybody came then. Gropius came and, Frank, you know, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright went to Cuba. They all went to Cuba. Fascinating. And, and so I, I imagine the, um, the built form of Havana, for example, would have um, uh, brick and stucco buildings and then you got the, these influxes of reinforced concrete, terracotta, right. mosaic, art deco, uh, a great everything. deal of inward investment then. Everything, uh, everything, every in every period. And one of the one of the unique things about Havana, and anyone who's been there knows this, is that when you, even though Havana is in terrible disrepair, you can actually see every period of architecture of the last 500 years in the city. You can walk like, you can walk from one end to the other of the of the history of the Western Hemisphere there. Yeah. And, and more recently, you've been 
returning there uh, on various occasions, um, notably running an APT trip uh, <laughs> on, on one occasion. Um, and what's your impression now of what's been happening to the, the built heritage of, of the place? Well, let me answer that in two ways. When I first went back to Cuba, I went back in 1992 for the first time. I went to a preservation conference because in 1990, when the Soviet Union collapsed, or 91, whichever it was, and Cuba suddenly found itself in economic freefall, they started fomenting co cultural tourism, and they had a lot of conferences. And I got to go to do a co to a conference in Havana. I was in, you know, I I submitted an application, and I gave a paper there on the Watts Towers of all things, because I was working on it at the time. And you know, there was a lot of disrepair, but there was a lot of hope that things would start to get repaired. And, you know, there's been the back and forth hope and lack of hope over the years. I mean, since 1992, we've seen it go up and down in terms of opening of relations, closing them back up, the ability for people to wear. And, you know, and for men, and when we did that APT tour, I remember there it was a moment when everybody was expecting that it was going to open any time now. And I remember the group was everybody was just like looking about what project are we going to work on? What do, what do we want? It was like that. Ah! But there was literally, there's literally enough there to keep everyone we know working for the rest of our lives. Unfortunately, nothing's really changed in terms of the ability for U.S. citizens to work in Cuba. Now, it's true, Canadians can work in Cuba and anyone else can, but it's tricky because the government does own most buildings and it's very of uh, uh, buildings, all the all the top class, you know, um, historic buildings. It's very challenging to work there, and and hard to right. to think about what's not being done. And given all the sanctions that have been imposed, then inward investment to um, adapt and and preserve and restore properties is probably very limited indeed. Totally, totally. And yet you get you'll get this glimmer. I you know, I write about this in the book that like when I discovered Cuba <clears throat> in 92, it was like my world changed because I was a conservator. My parents had never told me about the historic character of Havana because they, they didn't see it that way. My father designed a building when he was 17 years old. This is one of the things about my dad that he wanted to be an architect. And his father said he could not go to architecture school. He had to work in the family business. He designed a building. It's what we now consider um, everyday ordinary modernism. And it's beautiful in that sort of simple way of a modernist building. But for him, it was just a building. It's one of the, right? And for my mother who lived in Old Havana, for her, Old Havana was horrible because it was things about my dad so that he was poor. Someone popped in? Anyway. We're good. We're good. Yes. So anyway, so um, that that's interesting. It's kind of ironic because both your parents have been involved in the optic opticians business. Right. So, but it, it looks as though they kind of you know their built environment was not spectacularly important to them in various ways. And yet, your mom, I read in the book, um, has a very very strong perception of beauty. Absolutely, my mother. For my mother, beauty is about put together and clean. So she doesn't like old buildings. She likes new buildings. She loves the city of Aventura if any, in Florida. If anyone's ever been there, it's just, you know, ghastly. It's, <laughs> right. But my father, you know, my father did care a great deal about buildings when he was young. He loved it. And he read, he, he used to get Brazilian architecture magazines in the 1950s wow. and that's how he got the idea for his apartment building but i think when he was absolutely forbidden to study it was it was one of his first big heartbreaks and it sort of lasted throughout his lifetime yeah yeah that that's that's a tragic in in many ways y your mom um clearly had um artifacts that she owned that she um you know, carried meaning from one place to another. And I'm kind of fascinated by that. Um, you know, I, I was responsible for for the English Heritage Project about values and significance that the English Heritage Conservation Principles. So 
uh, we don't all value and, and give significance to the same things. And uh, there's a great story in the book about your mother's sweetie bowl, which I kind of liked. Uh, I mean, you described it very well last night in, in, a, in a book signing event downtown in LA that um, it's a pretty grotty piece of piece of pottery or something, but it's she, a, she carried it with her everywhere. Yeah, it's one of these cut crystal glass bowls like oh, the kind wow. that you find in you know you know in the in the in the glassware department of macy's but like the super expensive or or you'd find in a, in a high-end uh gift store um it was made in bavaria or somewhere like that and <clears throat> it's you know it's a basket it's about this big with a handle that you can't use because you can't lift up and she fills it with you know hershey's chocolates you know those little wrapped mini chocolates and it sat on our coffee table for as long as I could remember. It's kind of an awful thing, but she brought it with her from Cuba because it was a gift from her uncle who was a diamond cutter. And he had bought it, brought it with him from Europe when he came to Cuba. So we still have it. She still has it in her, uh, in her independent living facility in South Florida. Filled with chocolates, you know, filled with chocolates. It, it reminded me a little of... of um the advertisement for Antiques Roadshow on, on public TV here, yeah. where there's a Ming vase that, you know, right. travels through history and loses value entirely and ends up uh, uh, with some chips in a bowl at a student party and then gets valued at the roadshow for millions of dollars. Um, in, in terms of the work you've been doing on public sculpture and art in general, you must come across a, some incredibly expensive art objects uh, that your clients have bought that you know many people would say were pretty ugly what's what's your what's your view on that well you know as as you mentioned I do two kinds of work I work it's actually kind of three I work on private collections of high-end contemporary art for the most part I work on historic buildings with you for example um and and architects and contractors and then I also work with museums and municipal public art agencies that have public collections. So I think what you're referring to is the stuff that people collect, and particularly the contemporary art world. Contemporary art world is this, oh, it's its own odd animal. It's this era, it's this world of, of where value is assigned to things in such a short time, and the value is astronomical, and people pay fortunes for works of art with artists that become hot, where they'll literally be on waiting lists to buy this stuff. And I'm sometimes looking at it and I'm thinking, oh man, are you in for a world of hurt? Because there's no way these things are not going to fall apart. And it's and it's a kind of moment of history that we're living in where, where um, treasures, if you will, are made of non-treasure materials. And their value is assigned to them simply because of a market, not of something else. That's that sector. Right. Right. Good, good, good point. Um, some of these materials, and you mentioned plastics in the book, a fascinating area of, of uh, discovery at the moment scientifically, but where the assumption by some artists has been that they're, uh, well, some, some artists aren't interested in longevity for their their their, um, their outputs whilst others are but they don't know sufficient about the materials to to ensure they have longevity and that they're durable and plastics is a particularly challenging area I know, I know from that regard because my even my hiking boots implode as they off gas and, right. and the soles come off and you end up being a clown in the desert walking right. um but, um, and in my own work, I've uh, been dying to give a lecture on mission impossible, you know, the materials where there's, there's no real answer to it uh, at all. You must have come across this too in, in uh, the conservation work you've done. Oh, all the time, all the time. I mean, the thing about plastics is it's fascinating because all of a sudden, you know, the plastics are sort of a product of the late 19th century, early 20th century, and by the time of the war of the second world war um they were making so many different kinds of plastics that when the war ended it was like an explosion of materials available to make everything from 
containers to put your food in to all children's toys. Um, and a lot of these things are materials that are new, they're brand new. And that's fine because a lot of materials are disposable in some of these objects that we buy. Like for example, even the computers that you and I are talking on right now or the, the headphones that I'm wearing, they're gonna be obsolete in God knows how long, probably not a very long time. But when these then become heritage objects for whatever reason, whether it's the Kloss Oldenburg soft screw, which is falling apart wherever it is, or a spacesuit from from the first moonwalk, then we are racing against the possibility of something that has no solution. Yeah. Now with with soft screw, as I showed last night, the it we've been refabricating them. I, when I say we, I say me with the original fabricator with the approval of Gemini who made them, and um, the old and the artist Oldenburg. But when you have other things, and, and when it comes to buildings now, buildings have a lot of synthetics. I, I met an architect the other day, a young architect that was making buildings out of Corian, which to me is nuts. It's nuts. But, you know, people, avant-gardeness kind of pushes toward a certain type of experimentation that isn't always uh, looking to the future. Yeah, that's true. Uh, you and I have both worked in Martha on Donald okay. Judd's stuff. Yeah. And, uh, right. I forgot you know, he, he had a, a brief engineering um, career and then got into his uh, his minimalist materials and his his metal work and his concrete have done pretty well. But um, his external um, wooden furniture is a complete disaster. Um, you know, there's no end grain sealers. There's no coatings for joints that fill with water. Um, uh, and but the Judd Foundation and the Chinati Foundation they have no qualms about replicating that stuff, but then it's it's not the real thing, and he's no longer around to say yes or no. So I I find that anomalous. I agree with you a hundred percent, and I will take it a bit further, which because it speaks to this idea that there are certain entities, be they artists, studios, or foundations, that have the last word on what is possible and what is not. And we live in a world, certainly in the in the conservation of sculpture and contemporary art, where we are beholden to the artist's opinion in a way that I find has gone too far. This is the first time I've said this publicly, but I've been feeling it a lot lately, because you'll have situations where artists want to control the narrative around the conservation of their work, and they don't know what they're talking about and their studios don't know what they're talking about. And sometimes it's an economic thing where they only want this one entity to take care of it. This has happened to us with, um, should I, shouldn't I, I'm not gonna mention names. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but certain artists will say, you know, you'll have something like a plaster finger that needs to be repaired. And they'll say, you have to ship that piece to New York to have a plaster finger repaired because we have our own special plaster mix that we use to do that. And you go, that's not, that's nonsense. You don't repair plaster with plaster. But I, I think this is a new frontier in conservation where, you know, we've become, we've, we've sort of taken a quasi-religious approach to the word of the artist and that's going to have to change yeah good point good point um let's change the subject a little how did you get into this business in, in the first place conservation or writing yeah conservation so it, i was it, it was by total fluke um i went to college my parents though they were conservative cuban jews and in my community girls did not uh, we're not allowed to go away to college. They let me go. And I went to Boston and I studied at Brandeis University. I was studying visual arts. I was pretty good at making things, but I didn't have any anything to say with my artwork. So to be an artist, you have to know how to make things, but you have to have content as well. I didn't have the latter. And a professor, a wonderful professor whose wife was a famous paper conservator, suggested to me that I look into conservation as a career path and that was it, you know, he set it in motion and that's how I got in. And what, you know, I describe in the book how I was ill-prepared when I got there, much less qualified than my other students. And I went to NYU to the yeah. Fine Arts, Pro the Institute of Fine Arts. Yeah, good, good program. Um, I, I found that uh, 
clients and members of the public find it very difficult to um, to understand what conservation is as as a, a concept, uh, uh, as a philosophy, and um, as a strategy. You mentioned your mother wanting everything squeaky clean and new. I, I remember Jean Marie, my wife, um, telling me that once she had a a, a a gang of of students from Texas uh, who she was showing around Rome, and there was a a near riot in the hotel when she had to explain to them that old did not mean dirty. <laughs> so, um, how how do you totally. how do you um, how do you talk to folks you have to interface with about what the process is and why it's important? Right. Um... Yes, exactly. That it's it's challenging because of all the reasons that you know. The number one being that we don't we're neither fish nor fowl. We're not a contractor. We're not an architect. We're not an engineer. We're not a chemist. We're sort of everything, and nothing at the same time. And in part, it's a function of the problem of our profession in the United States that cannot see how to give us professional credibility through certification of any sort, you know, so that you walk into a room and, and you are beholden to the opinion of whoever else is in there. So with private clients, it's pretty safe because they've called you because they need you. So when you go to a private client, it's usually because a museum has, has asked for you. And in the art world, it's getting much better. And, and in part, it has to do with these crazy values of contemporary and modern art. But in architecture, we still have the problem that there are many locations, many parts of the country where the conservator is maybe called or maybe not called. And sometimes the architect just claims that they're the conservator. I cannot tell you how many times I've read specifications that have been written by architects who do not have training in historic preservation or conservation. And they're basically just using whatever material some manufacturer has said to them, you know, to spec. Like I've read specs where marble is supposed to be, losses to marble are supposed to be filled with epoxy, you know, stuff like that. And I think that's partially because people don't know what we do. And in, in the world of buildings, especially, they feel since, since since the projects are so cumbersome, there's so many parties already, and they're so expensive. They figure we can cut this piece yeah. out. Um, I mean, I, as an architect, you're both because you're you're a preservation architect and a conservation, uh, an architectural conservator. So I, you have you wear both hats. I wear both hats and and attempt to build the middle ground in, in exactly. all of that. As you said, what I've noticed here in the states. And I wonder if it's true amongst um, similar professionals in, in Cuba as well. But uh, here in the States, I've noticed attitudes towards building materials um, change across the country. In, in, um, in the older parts of the United States, let's put it that way, on the eastern seaboard, if you have a terracotta building, most clients will say, well, let's, let's repair it with terracotta. You don't have to twist their arms particularly. Um, whereas uh, over here, um, it's a younger um, culture, a, young, a younger city, and a lot of people from elsewhere, and the influence of Hollywood with um, very good-looking temporary materials used on sets in Hollywood, the attitude says, well, why don't we make it in plastic or cast stone or something? You know, what's cheaper? You know? Right. So have you noticed those cultural differences towards materials? I have indeed, and I the way I I have indeed, and I the way I sort of always see it is that you know you have in in, the, in this country you have the Northeast, you know, say Maine to Virginia, right, where you have the influence of the the big architectural conservation programs. You have you have the spheres of of Martin Weaver and Frank Matero kind of like making everybody, you know behave themselves if you will <laughs> <laughs> and it and it extends <clears throat> to the midwest say california is a little bit of a free-for-all you know um getting better in some in some areas getting better because you know there are good architects and good conservators partnering but there's still that rogue attitude and then in miami 
Miami is kind of a, its own thing because we work a lot in Miami. Um, Miami is its own thing because you do get some influence from the Northeast bleeding down, but you do have a lot of local talent, if you will, that are that are still, you know, playing really fast and loose with with the whole notion. Yeah. Well, you well, know, in Havana a few years ago, this was really interesting. Um, a an important hotel, the Saratoga Hotel, a hotel from like 1906, was cons- restored, let's call it, into a modern luxury hotel. And <clears throat> one day, I'm walking by it, and I see pieces of the cornices falling on the ground. And they were made out of styrofoam. They had made them. They had repaired them with. Styrofoam. They had refabricated them in styrofoam in the tropics. So things haven't really changed there because I remember there's, there's a brilliant. Your book is full of bon mots and great one-liners. I remember you write about Havana that there's a phrase in Spanish that, that the place rains balconies or something. Right, right, right. <laughs> Yo viendo balcones. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's another cultural issue in, in a sense. Um, the concept of maintenance in particularly in, in economically stressed societies is a very difficult one to, to get over in, in some parts of the world. Uh, in, in my own missions to Brazil, for example, mm. the, the only churches that I saw in, in good condition with you know roofs that kept the water out and therefore the termites out from all that Rococo plaster work in Aro Preto was the churches where there was a Belgian priest in charge. Oh, that's interesting. Because they, they maintained it. They maintained them, right? And he he used that as a, a mission to employ youngsters and get them trained and give them a craft. Whereas in other places, you know, it was you know, the churches were planned for the mission of, of uh, the gospel and they were falling down all the time, you know. Interesting. Well, wow. very interesting. That's yeah. super interesting. That is really interesting. And in Cuba, you know, um, the historian of Havana, Eusebio Leal, who was not a historian at all, or, or he wasn't a preservation professional. He just took it upon himself to to put his life's work into preserving old Havana. He started a school to th- that trained youngsters in the traditional preservation trades, and and they fanned out across the island doing really good work. But then, of course. When money started pouring into the country, they started calling themselves conservators. And you have people from that program in Miami with studios that conserve paintings and, and other works of art where, you know, but but in Havana, they did good work. Oh, interesting. Why don't we show a few pictures if we Let's can show some pictures that bring up? Yeah, I think okay. I can share my screen. Um let me wait. Let me just do this the right way. Hold it. One sec. Okay. Let me. I'm almost there. Yeah, there you go. We got it. Can we yeah. see it? Let me see, am I doing it right? Here we go. There you so, go, perfect. So what do, we, what do we got? We got we got uh, a fo- some photos that Mark Gilberg from LACMA shared with me that he had of me working at the Watts Towers. There's in the photo of me standing with the black shirt, the one that Carolina said I look like I'm in, a, in, a, in an 80s girl band. <laughs> it's me and Donna Williams working on the Watts Tower. I think the, uh, it says... Uh, it's 1991, I believe. Um, and uh, yeah, we're doing some work on the Watts Towers. And that's me in the, at the Watts Towers also with Zulema Aguirre, who was the site conservator. And I think if I'm not mistaken, that that is, that's um, Ginny, 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 whose last name I always forget, uh, who was really kind of the uh, city official who who put her life's work into making sure the the towers were preserved and oh. those were the early days of work at the towers you know a number of us have worked on it that was when there was still a notion that you could get in there swoop in there repair them and get out which now of course is not the case it's clear that this is a a structure that straddles sculpture and architecture and is really only going to be preserved by ongoing maintenance there you go that's a good punchline for that okay next one 
let me see how I do this. Ah, so here's the next one. This is a project I worked on with Mel Green. Um, and of course I worked on the towers with Mel Green as well. Um, this is the uh, sculpture by Paul Conrad in Santa Monica um, that is right in front of Santa Monica City Hall. And it was, it's an, uh, a monument that is anti-nuclear war. And it's basically made of a, fiber, uh, of a steel structure with a fiberglass sheathing on top and then tons of copper uh, chain pipe around um, chain around it. And a couple of years ago, somebody, some city official saw somebody climbing on it and they freaked out. And suddenly the sculpture had a fence around it. There was discussion of tearing it down. It became a huge cause celeb in the city with the heirs of the artist um, threatening to sue and the city very worried about the lifespan of fiberglass on a giant project was done. They found that the fiberglass was fine, it was stable. And the, the work basically involved cleaning, removing some ferrous metal connections from the copper and repainting the top to just make sure that it had a good protection from UV. Spectacular, next one. This is our project, John. Oh, yeah. um, the Miami Marine Stadium, 1963 building on the waterfront in Miami by Hilario Candela, a Cuban architect who came to the United States when he was in his 20s and had studied at Georgia Tech and came out of the tradition of Cuban modernist architects. This building was pretty much abandoned by the city of Miami in the 1990s after Hurricane Andrew because they were hoping for demolition by neglect because they never really figured out how to monetize the building. And in 2013 or in 2010, Friends of Miami Marine Stadium set up a nonprofit to take care of it. And in 20, was it 16, John? That yeah, we, 2016. We got a uh, grant from the Getty Foundation's Keeping It Modern Initiative to look at two things in particular. Well, this is the building as it was built. This is a poured in place concrete structure. Hyperbolic paraboloids. Right. It was the, a hyperbolic paraboloid roofline. Great thing to say. That is, um, that was the longest expanse of cantilevered concrete in at the time it was built. It was built for the purpose of boat of being a grandstand for watching boat races. And when John and I got involved in the project, basically the two key things we were looking at is what to do about removing the graffiti safely without destroying the character of the um, unpainted concrete, because you you know you just can't go in there and sandblast that. And also what to do about the extraordinary amount of cracking, and this is just one small example, of cracking of the concrete and how could you make those repairs to the concrete in a way that that did not, that, that looked okay because you didn't have anywhere to hide your repairs. This is unpainted, this is exposed concrete. Yeah. So we did a pro, yeah. So go ahead. You talked about it. This baby sits in seawater, so also exactly. a challenge. Exactly, exactly. And I think one of the really fun parts of this project that we did is that we ran a, we ran a a, a, a little meeting in Miami. It was a, like a little workshop or symposium, which we wanted it to be a much bigger thing, but we only had budget for a half day meeting where we got the architect, preservation stakeholders, city officials and the graffiti community to talk to each other about the future of the building. And some lovely things came out of that meeting because for one thing, the architect felt very indebted to the graffiti artist for taking his building and giving it new meaning because we're only showing this, but if you look up Miami Marine Stadium online, you'll see thousands of photos of beautiful graffiti and paintings and murals and the architect felt, you know, the city abandoned his building to the elements and young people took it over. But they, in turn, said to the city and to the architect, we respect your work, sir. And if this city will take care of it, then we'll leave, we'll leave it alone. But if yeah. you let if you leave it to fall apart, then it's ours. We, we even proposed that um, if the building, if the structure was reused, then uh, walls should be built in the car park that could be freely tagged forevermore as an alternative to this particular. And the architect loved that idea, yeah. remember? But the, there was a, then there was a, a new, um, an RFP came out and they did, they repeated a lot of the work that John and I did. 
and some and basically the the architect the the original architect was partnered with another architect and they kind of disavowed that idea whatever yeah we had we had some fun challenges with uh, cleaning trials also because totally. Even, totally. even though we left notices to explain what we were doing and why they, our protect protection over the the panels for cleaning was vandalized right uh, right uh, our, our clean tag areas were re-tagged pretty quickly. <laughs> right. And some of this work that we did here, John, has been used in in a number of different uh, workshops on cleaning concrete. And hopefully they will use the m protocols that we set forth in the, when the buildings eventually work done. Yeah, that's we hope good. It will be. Well, we... Um... I mean, Let's let's do a few more. This this is a spectacular project. Which, this is uh, this okay. So okay, this is I, I love this. This project was one of those projects that I describe in the book as like where you where someone asks you to do something that just feels so cool that you say yes even though you have no idea what you're going to do and you figure it out. You just figure it out. This is a mosaic that is a hundred feet long by seventeen feet high on the facade of Houston Methodist Hospital in Houston. And as you can see on the image on the left, they built a port cocher over it that kind of hid about a foot of the bottom of the mosaic. And when they, the, the hospital, this hospital has tons of money, they decided to move the, they decided to build a new building and they thought, well, what could we explore the possibility of moving this mosaic indoors? And they called us, we were fortunately called into this one. And we said, yeah, well, yeah, we can discuss it. The main thing we have to do is figure out, can we get, can we get it off? And if we can get it off, can we put it, can we stitch it back together without it being noticeable? The one thing that we didn't count on was the fact that because this port cocher is right over the emergency room, we couldn't put a crane there. So we had to cut the mosaic into pieces that could be lowered by gantry. So as you can see on the right, the sections were not all that big. Let me, so, and here, so we, but we did, we cut it and this is us putting it back together. You can see on the left, the cuts, we had tons of leftover tesserae that we were able to put back in place. Um, it was pretty much a grueling project at a certain point. Yeah, you had a lot of collaboration from the engineers and architects, I imagine, to get this done. We did, we did. Um, interestingly, we had to, the, the engineer from, that was working on the building itself was assigned to us as the engineer for the project. And while they were perfectly good and capable engineers, they didn't really understand conservation and they had recommendations for us. So we brought in Craig Bennett from Charleston to kind of lend the conservation word to the project. So anyway, what the little image with Christ's face, it shows how we made our cuts to avoid any major features like a face like that. Right. And this is the mosaic put back to place where, you know, you have a sense of the ghosting of the sections, but it's pretty much, it's pretty readable. Sure. Legibility is a, is a big deal yes. for conservation. And John, you should talk about this one because we worked for you on this one. Yeah, I was I, I was um, amazed at the level of attention uh, that Christina Varvey and her colleagues paid to to uh, working on this. Every tessera was knuckle tapped by by her her and her colleagues' knuckles, um, <laughs> identifying all the uh, loose and damaged materials where the voids were. Spectacular work. And just to make, because maybe there are people here who doesn't, don't know my relationship to Christina Varvey. Christina Varvey was a student at Columbia who came to work for me in 2013, I think it was, or 2012. I can't even remember. I feel like I was born with Christina by my side. And um, she and I've worked exceptionally well together. And she is now the owner and president of RLA Conservation, the company I founded in LA and Miami, I now work for her. Fantastic. And my original intention when I brought you guys onto this project was that you would actually do all the conservation work yourselves. But right. to explain to everyone, this this there was a, a, a labor agreement between the city and the owners and the trade unions, and it, it, it had to be a union shop to do the work. 
So uh, Rosa, your colleagues had to teach all these tilers how to use Dremel tools and and try and control their thumbs, right? Totally, totally, totally. <laughs> it's a it's a great thing. I, I I imagine you see this all the time as you drive along Wilshire. Completely. Well, first of all, I try to not drive in that intersection because it's like it's like a stew of cars and construction to this day. Um, I think because of the train, but I live walking distance from there and have been seeing that building for as long as I've been in LA, which is now over 35 years. It's a really beautiful building. It's a, yeah. quite a, and it's actually quite kind of great inside too. You know, people kind of joked about this and that about it, but it's a really cool museum. When I, when I made the pitch for the job, I, uh, I I told Whoopi Goldberg and Tom Hanks, who were the trustees. Oh, that's so great. When I when I'd finished, uh, it wouldn't look like a Beverly Hills facelift. It would actually look like an old building. And that's and you great. mentioned in the book, Rosa, about um, uh, what do you say, nullifying presence? That can you just speak about that a little? Yes, because, you know, that that's the role of us as conservators, that we're not there to leave our imprint on the work. We're there to do what we need to do to um, conserve the materials, to preserve them, to improve them if that is what's warranted in terms of, you know, cleaning. But not to, you're not trying to go back to square one to make a building look like it was just made yesterday. I'm, I assume that everyone on this Zoom or webinar knows that, but but the nullification of our presence is important. We're we're supposed to work like we're 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 our work should be quiet. It should not be front and center. Good good point. What's next? Quickly, this is the damage to the San Gabriel Mission with the awful fire where we worked. Um, we did two aspects of this work. One directly with the mission to. Uh, conserve the Raritos, which is the retablo on the right hand side. And as you can see, it, the, the retablo um, was obviously was very impacted by the fire, but below the, the certain midpoint, it basically just got coated with soot, but above a certain point, everything was charred. And we worked very closely with Krista Rudis on developing uh, a solvent gel that would allow us to remove all that char, as you can see in the center section where you have um, our tests on Saint Gabriel, Saint Gabriel, um, whose whose entire figure was completely covered with that black char that you see on his arms, and we slowly but surely uncovered the coloration. It was really quite dramatic, and on wow. the left, the building itself, we worked with. Um, Caitlin Driscoll and Bob Knight and Mel Green to help identify the, the color scheme for the building. Spectacular work. Just on, on um, uh, solvent gels, for yes. we, we, you better explain what those are for this, this audience. Ah, How that's right, of course, of course, of course. So in um, the world of uh, materials conservation, there are, we work a lot with solvents to do cleaning, but very, it often happens that the solvent that you need to clean something, what is required to say, remove that char on the surface of that sculpture is too strong for what is below it and would re eliminate the, the paint underneath as well as that. So some very clever conservation scientists and conservators have come up with a an entire modular cleaning system for blending solvents into gels with water and other solvents that are weaker so that you could control the dwell time, which is the title of my book, that is required to remove those finish, those, those unwanted surfaces while retaining what is below it. You can control the time of something very strong with a solvent gel. That's fantastic. And, and, um, Either by temperature or in or on these in the case of these gels by a, a, adapting the pH, the alkalinity or acidity of the right. of the gel, you get you get different effects and and the the challenge is to find the right one for the the materials and its substrate. Excellent. And there's some excellent courses you know taught in this you know a lot locally in in Southern California we have one of the great masters of this, Krista Rudis 
Um, the thing is that when it comes to something really hard like this, I, my feeling is he's in town. I don't need to be reinventing the wheel. Let me just call him. And he did. He came and figured it out. Good job. Uh, listen, we we better. Um, yeah, let's uh, uh, let's just questions and answers. Yeah, so let's let's go to the Q and A's. I'm there's me, and I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen. That's good. Yeah. Good PPE kit you're wearing there, right? Isn't it? Although I'm like obviously not, that's water, by the way. <laughs> that is water. Here we are again. So, so Lisa, Lisa, are you gonna do the questions? I would be happy to. Um... So thank you, first and foremost, uh, both of you. It's been a great discussion so far, uh, so far excuse me. Um, our first question, uh, David said, Rosa, first of all, uh, thanking you for acknowledging the professor, the pro excuse me, the professor um, who started you on this career path. I believe that David is also uh, an educator, says sometimes we get it right. Uh, his uh, questions are, uh, if the artist is not always the best decider about conservation, where does the original fabric belong? Is it the critical issue or can design intent be more important? Um, wow, that's such a big question. We're just gonna um, hit you right out of the gate. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you did not lead up to any. Um, the, the material itself, has its own demands. I, I would think that, and I don't know if that know if that's what you mean by design intent, but the material itself has tells you what it needs very often. And also the intent of the aesthetic tells you what it needs. Um, and sometimes the artist, uh, it's good to know what the artist thinks. You have to know what the artist thinks, but that doesn't mean that they are the arbiter of what you need to do, right? I hope that answered it. John, do you have a thought on that? It's it, it, it's a it, it's a an interesting question. We, we we address this in the English heritage conservation principles because for the longest time in England, really under the influence of William Morris and and the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, um, monuments uh, uh, with all the changes that go on through time centuries. Uh, were more or less preserved as they are found with warts and all, you know, ugly Victorian pieces stuck on the side and so on. Um, and uh, in addressing values and significance, we, we came to see that the balance or, or the emphasis given by conservation professions has really been so material focused that um, there's some really ugly repairs, for example. Uh, they're, they're called honest repairs very often, but they're ugly as sin. And uh, establishing establishing what the original intent was in terms of design intent sometimes is a way to reinforce the original architectural design message, the horizontal lines in classical architecture and, and so on. So I, I, it's it's horses for courses, as the Brits would say, and <laughs> on, on context, obviously. All right, thank you both. Um, David also asked uh, what your most meaningful project was so far. Well, you know, it's been a long career, so I often don't remember, but the Marine Stadium is to me really meaningful for a number of reasons that I write about in the book. And one is because it's, it's the monument to the to Cuban heritage in Miami. It's the most important Cuban building in the United States. And working with John and working on the Keeping It Modern grant, it was, it was, it was like a confluence of all things that were meaningful to me. But I also have to, I can't not uh, mention the rescue of the murals at Holy Trinity Cathedral in Port-au-Prince, Haiti after the earthquake. These were murals on um, on a thin concrete render on rubble walls. And after this devastating earthquake, um, these the Haitian colleagues that we worked with there were just adamant that these things had to be preserved even when there was spectacular human misery in the country at the time. That was very moving. Great, and that actually uh, leads into another question. Um, what you know about the future of Marine Stadium, uh, and if you're optimistic about it. I am optimistic about it because I refuse not to be. It, to be not optimistic about it is devastating to me. So 
So there are many people that are working on it, some colleagues in Miami. There's been this one dogged advocate for the for the building called named Don Worth, who's just been the problem with Miami is that Miami is owned by developers and this piece of land that this and water that this is on is extremely sexy for hotels and yacht parking. And so there are a number of commissioners that are turning themselves inside out looking for reasons not to preserve the building, but the advocacy for it is very strong. The outcry would be huge. And then, you know, it's on the national register. It's on the local register. It's on the state register. It's been on the most endangered buildings at World Monuments Fund and the National Trust for Historic Preservation and one at Getty. So I'm going to remain optimistic. Although Hilario passed away last year. So it's, you know, sad that he didn't get to see it. Great. Um, and then uh, one additional question. Uh, what was the museum building originally? Oh, the, the May the Company May building. Uh, the, the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures was uh, a department store. It was the second one built by the May Company um, out of town in the, in the New Burbs in uh, the 1930s. And it's on what is now called the Miracle Mile, of course, uh, on Wilshire and Fairfax uh, at the western end. And like a lot of buildings along there, from Bullocks at the east end to the May Company's building at the west end of, of Wilshire, many of the buildings were eye catchers. They have um, Art Deco and other um, towers and features uh, to attract passing motorists. So these were meant to be places where um, uh, folks would do all their um, shopping, their millinery and other kind of shopping, um, vast car parks associated with these buildings. And there are two schools of thought about the, the um, hemi-cylindrical uh, mosaic, uh, either that it represents uh, a perfume bottle surrounded by granite columns, pylons and a bridge, or it could also represent a pile of money. That's great. I love that. <laughs> That's great. It's so good that that building was was worked on so judiciously and carefully. You know. Yeah, uh, I mean, we had great challenges on on the job. I, I think we got all on very well with the team, design Renzo Piano's team with uh, Gensler as executive architects generally and with map construction. Um, but what, where we were coming from was a, a totally different mindset than theirs. Renzo Pino's office was describing everything as a tolerance of a couple of millimeters. And we shrugged our shoulders and said, if we get half an inch, we'd be fine with some of the to tolerances and our, our stuff. Uh, they were um, uh, you know, specifying RAL color tones and tints to the nth degree for furniture and fittings. Uh, and we said, no, we got to do it by eye, get get that gold mosaic stuff on, on there and, and look at it. And then we had challenges. We were, um, Christina Varvey was applying grouts using very sensitive hydraulic uh, materials. And the engineers working for Matt would come along and say, see, that's not taken. And they could pull them off with their hand because they didn't understand the setting characteristics of some of these hydraulic mortars. So we got through it all and, you know, we've got eight or nine awards nationally and internationally for the work. So we're all very proud. Yes, John, <laughs> you've been so good about applying for awards. It's great. <laughs> well, thank you both so much. Uh, it's one o'clock, so I'm sure we need to let some of our uh, audience go. Um, Thank you, John, for the great questions and your insights. Thank you, Rosa, for sharing so much um, about yourself and about your work and, and especially your memoir. Um, into the chat, I've put links to Rosa's personal and practice websites, uh, as well as links uh, to multiple locations where you can purchase her book, Dwell Time. On behalf of myself and our education committee and our speakers, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, when you close your Zoom window, you'll be redirected to a survey. Uh, we'd appreciate your feedback uh, on this webinar as well as recommendations for future topics for us. Thank you, Rosa. That's what it looks like in case you're wondering.
And thank you, John. Um, Thanks for doing this, John. Yeah, thank you both. Um, uh, thank you all. Uh, have a great afternoon, and we hope to see you at a program soon. We'll be Bye. there. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye.